Does everyone have a handout? Everyone has the packet? Excellent. So in this packet, you'll see the talk for next time right up front. You'll have the slides, and then in the back is just a little form for you to fill out like a survey of the talk, just so we can know how we're doing and how fast it goes, you guys. We have pens. As I mentioned, that there's water. You can stop back and use the bathroom at any time. Now I will turn it over to you. Good morning. Thanks for coming. My name is Marty Donovan. I own the Natural Wellness Corner. I'm a pharmacist, nutritionist, and herbalist. And my focus uh, for the past 25 years has really been natural medicine. Although I'm a pharmacist, uh, this has been for a long time. Uh, really, my love is natural medicine. And my disappointment in um, current medicine is the using drugs to treat symptoms and not trying to get to the underlying reason of what's going on. And sometimes with disastrous results, and unfortunately today is gonna to be a good example uh, of that situation. So you'll see my frustration over the years dealing with filling these kinds of prescriptions when people can do something better for themselves. So uh, my focus now is not on filling prescriptions, but on counseling people nutritionally and helping them with proper guidance on how to take natural supplements. So today we've got the talk on building stronger bones for all ages, how to take care of your bones uh, through nutrition and lifestyle. And Bones are, are dynamic and we need to work on them all the time. They're not just a static material in our body. They are uh, living, active, and very, very important, as I hope you'll see through this presentation. So it's something we need to be aware of and think about uh, so that we can be our healthiest that we can be. So today what we're going to talk about is what do bones do? What is healthy bone function? What is bone thinning? How do you support your bones? and how do you test your bones? So, to start with, it's really important to understand that bones play a role, many different roles in our body. They provide structure. I mean, we are able to stand up because of our bones. They protect our organs, they anchor our muscles, they store calcium. And while it's important to build strong and healthy bones during childhood and adolescence, you think of growing up and needing to build those strong bones, you need to make sure that you're maintaining those healthy bones throughout your whole adulthood in order to protect your bones and prevent bone loss. So what actually do bones do? Some of their functions are supporting our body structure and protecting our vital organs, allowing our body to move, production of red blood cells in the bone marrow, acts as a storage area for minerals, in particular calcium. It supports our energy, our immune system, and our brain function has a lot of varying roles you wouldn't think would normally be associated with just a structural item. So bones provide a framework to support our body. Our muscles, tendons, ligaments are all tied in together with our bones and without anchoring uh, those bones we wouldn't be able to move. Essentially we're a pile of bones. You know, you see these in, you know, the, on TV, the doctor's office, and you've got a whole skeleton together. Well, they don't stay that way naturally. They would just be a pile of bones on the floor. They have to be held together with all the connective tissue and parts of your body in order for you to work and, and function normally. Some of the bones will protect your body's internal organs. They actually encase, so like your, your skull encases your brain, protects that from trauma, and your ribs uh, protect your heart and lungs. And there are actually metabolic functions that happen with bone. Metabolic means ongoing living processes that need to go on for you to be alive properly. They're a major area of storage. Um, they act as reserve for minerals, particularly calcium and phosphorus. Uh, bone marrow and adipose tissue, bone marrow adipose tissue can also store fatty acids. So there's storage going on there. Endocrine, uh, that relates to hormones. Bones are, they help build hormones for growth. For, uh, they help to support healthy insulin and they help to support healthy brain. Uh, and they release hormones for kidney, blood sugar, and fat function. Calcium balance. This is a really, really important one and relates directly to some of the problems in today's lifestyle about why do we have thin bones. Bones can raise or reduce calcium in your bloodstream by either forming new bone and taking calcium out of your blood or breaking down bone and putting that calcium in your bloodstream. That's a product called resorption. And that's called bone remodeling and we're going to get into that thoroughly. This relates directly to bone thinning because if you're not taking in adequate calcium on a daily basis, 
your body will go to your bones and borrow it. And over years and years and years, you're maintaining your body balance by sacrificing your tissue. It's like having a savings account that you never replenish and you keep on drawing down from it in order to support your household. Uh, also, bones are involved in helping our body to be safe from toxins. They, de they actually store some of the heavy metals that can damage us, like lead, mercury, arsenic, uh, from keeping them from circulating in your bloodstream. In fact, your bone will preferentially take up lead if it has the option over calcium. Even though it's bad for it, it, it will take up lead first if it's available. That's why it's so damaging, like kids chewing with the lead paint and things like that a long time ago. So what's going on with bones uh, in terms of what are they made of? They, they're made of collagen, which is a protein. And this forms like a soft framework. We think of bones as being rigid, like a rock, but they're not. They're a combination of both organic material and inorganic material. So collagen would be part of the organic matrix. Calcium is a rock, and that hardens and gives it strength. So this is the inorganic side of bone. And about 99% of the body calcium are found in your bones. But they also contain other minerals that are also important. Magnesium. Magnesium is almost like rebar in bone. It helps to harden it and make it stronger. Uh, phosphorus, fluoride, zinc, manganese, copper, silicon, boron, molybdenum. So there's a variety of different minerals that really need to be there for good, healthy bone uh, function. So bones are actually living cells. That's why they can, you break a bone, you can heal. Um, so this is a, um, a mineral-based organic matrix. The matrix consists of organic components, mostly type 1 collagen, and the inorganic components like the minerals. Collagen gives the bones flexible strength. That's why your bones don't break easily when you fall or when you bend your, your, your arm uh, bone. It doesn't just shatter. So it, it's meant to be flexible. Um, hydroxyapatite is another ingredient in bone, and this actually gives it compressive strength, so it doesn't crush easily, makes it resistant to compression. And bones don't stop growing at puberty. Again, you're growing all the time. They're living active and continually remodeled throughout our whole lives. So what is bone remodeling? The, the process of keeping your bones young involves cells you have in your body called osteoclasts in your bones that actually will break bone down. They're breaking down old bone, bone that needs to be replaced. And on the other hand, the osteoblasts are the ones that actually build new bone. And then the osteocyte is merely the, the, the ones in the middle or the yellow ones are the osteoblasts that are now finished and they're surrounded by the bone that they've made. So the balance between these two things is really, really important. And we'll talk more about that. So again, here's a little, little more picture of that. The osteoclast, which is the ones that break bone down, have the function of disrupting the old bone tissue. Hyperactivity of osteoclasts is the cause and onset of osteoporosis. So you see the top slide, there's pores in the bone. But the bottom slide, there's much, many, many more pores in the bone. Um, so osteoporosis li literally means porous bone. So the osteoblasts have the function to produce new bone tissue, and then a proper balance between those two is what's important. If you're, as long as you're making it and breaking it down at the same rate, your bones will stay at the same rate, same strength. But the, so the bones are always changing. We're constantly building old, building new bone, getting rid of old. When we're young, our, the, 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 this process causes our, our bones to grow, so the, the building process is faster when we're young. And then most of us reach our peak bone mass around 30, which is a few years ago. Um, after that, unfortunately, you're more prone to losing bone than, uh, than you are gaining it. And that process of remodeling keeps your, again, keeps your bones flexible and healthy. You're creating new bone, and you actually replace your whole skeleton every 10 years. So this is not the skeleton you had when you were a teenager. It's a, it's a completely brand new model. So again, this allows for damage for, for repair again, like the fracture allows for growth and helps to regulate the calcium in your bloodstream. Okay, and by the way, anybody have a question at any time, please, please uh, let me know. I'd be glad to, to answer that. So with bone thinning, here you have normal bones. Again, you see the porousness, um, the normal porousness found in bones. With osteomalacia, which we don't hear a lot about, this is actually softening of the bones. Um, in kids, they call it rickets, 
and then in adults they call it osteomalacia. Essentially, it's mainly a vitamin D deficiency combined with a calcium deficiency. Um, and that's completely reversible by taking calcium and vitamin D. Osteopenia, on the other hand, is going from normal bone to bone loss. And you can see more pores there. Um, so this is a loss of, of the bone uh, mineral density. Unfortunately, with these, both osteopenia and osteoporosis, there are no signs or symptoms. There's no alert. There's no warning that this is going on. So it's a slow, steady loss. Um, and it, the only way you know it's going on at this stage, usually, the early stage, is by having a bone scan done uh, to detect that. So this is considered to be the stage between normal bone and osteoporosis. So osteoporosis, again, the bones are much more porous, significantly reduced bone density, uh, and they would call these frail bones. Higher fracture risk affects any bone, but more commonly the spine, the hips, and the ribs. Again, no signs or symptoms. It must be diagnosed with a scan. And also, um, there can be other complications that do show up, say you didn't get a scan, you may begin showing signs. They would be things like loss of height, a stooping posture, easy fractures. By then, by then, it, you're at the end stage of things. So you're, you're, you're way into it at this point. Yeah? If you are developing osteoporosis, can that be reversed by, you know, taking supplements? I don't know if you'll cover that later. But you're jumping ahead of me. Okay, we're going right, right. to get there. Yeah, and the answer is yes, yes absolutely. Okay. Um, so that the, by the time you see, you see uh, symptoms, you're really at a, 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 a far point in this. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can get back to normal. So what are some of the incidents of, oste of osteoporosis uh, itself? Uh, the first numbers relate to osteoporosis. The next ones I'll give you relate to fractures related to osteoporosis. So 54% of postmenopausal women have osteopenia, level of, of bone thinning. 30% have osteoporosis. So almost one in three women. And a lot of them are walking around and don't know it. Unfortunately, doctors, in my opinion, are not after this. Every single woman that comes in a doctor's office should be getting a DEXA scan every two years. That's the only way you know. Um, and that number is relative. If you're really, really healthy, strong bones, maybe you don't maybe need to do it every two years. But if you have bone loss, you need to do it every two years and evaluate what you're doing. Is it changing and making you better? So related to the uh, fractures, one in three women and one in five men, we don't talk a lot about men with this, over 50 will have an osteoporosis fracture in their lifetime. So again, these are not small numbers. Regarding hip fractures, there's a one to two week hospital stay after a hip fracture, and oftentimes more time is needed like in a rehab facility. Only one in four will recover fully. And there's a 20% risk of death within one year of having a hip fracture. And then 33% will end up being either totally dependent on other care or in some kind of a nursing home or something like that um, going on going forward. So the consequences of fractures, uh, what are the implications of getting a fracture? Fractures caused by osteoporosis can be severely painful and debilitating. There's a lot of discomfort uh, going on with that. Often requires long-term care in a nursing home. If bedridden, there's a higher likelihood of cardiovascular complications, more exposure to infectious diseases causes both physical and emotional stress. The loss of independence combined with loss of enjoyable activities reduces quality of life, often causing depression. Loss of activity can cause weight gain and increase bone stress. Weight gain also increases the risk of problems such as heart disease and diabetes. And the loss of independence, isolation, fear fractures, and financial strain can bring on a poor emotional state and can hinder your ability to manage health issues. So this is a a multi-phase problem. It's not just, oh, I broke a bone and I'm going to get better. This can change your life going forward. So big question, why do we even lose bone density? What's going on with that? So osteoporosis can occur when the removal process, meaning the osteoclasts, are going too fast, meaning you're, you've been, that activity for some reason is ramping up. 
new bones are forming too slowly, meaning the osteoblast activity is not keeping up with the osteoclast activity or for both reasons. So some of the factors involved in this, number one is diet. These are things we have control over. Common deficiencies with related to osteoporosis and bone thinning are calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin K. These are critical and huge. Sometimes it's merely the inability to take in calcium from your diet, like lactose intolerance or an allergy to, to milk products. Soft drinks, the, the carbonated um, soft drinks, contain something called phosphates that deplete calcium from your bones. And studies show that drinking one soft drink every day increases your risk by like 30%. Yes? Is that the same as seltzer water? Not the same as seltzer water. This would be Coke, Pepsi, um, the, the ones they use phosphates to carbonate. Seltzer would be, would be, water, would be carbon dioxide. So there's no problem with that. Um, so it's not the bubbly air, it's the how it's, why is it bubbling, and it's the phosphates in the common soft drinks. Uh, caffeine intake, uh, caffeine can cause you to shed calcium in your urine. Now I'm not saying a, a cup of coffee a day is bad for you, but if you're a regular coffee consumer, it's something just to keep in mind. Uh, heavy alcohol use also is linked to lower, lowering your calcium in your, in your bloodstream, which means you're taking it out of your bones. And having more than one drink a day for men or two for men, uh, one for women and two for men is considered to be heavy above that number. And then a high protein, and I mean like a really high protein, like you're eating, like the old Atkins where you're eating, you know, half a pound of bacon for breakfast and, and pork chop for lunch and, you know, steak for dinner, that kind of thing, and really nothing else. Uh, so, it, but a high protein and a high salt diet also cause you to shed calcium. Yeah. And they depend on the salt, because it depends whether it's going to let you It doesn't matter. Uh, no, the, the sodium, sodium chloride is the main components of salt. The Himalayan salts are just slightly, like maybe 1% less sodium than regular salt. Now they're better for you because the color in those, like the, or the, they're the pink or the yellow or the, the uh, gray, like Celtic, they contain other minerals like magnesium and calcium and potassium, which are very good for us. So it's kind of like you eat whole grain rice and you're getting the rice and you're getting the bran and you're getting the oil, or you eat minute rice and you're just getting the carb. With white, with white salt, you're just getting the sodium chloride, but with the other, you're getting the other ingredients. So it's better nutritionally. It's as high a risk for bone loss if you consume a lot of it. So it's a, it, the lot is the issue. In general, it's best just to get your sodium from your food, not really adding sodium to your diet. Um, that's really the issue with high blood pressure is you don't need to restrict sodium. Just don't use added salt and don't use don't use processed foods, you know, like microwave meals, things like that, or canned soups that will have a ton in them. Okay, so demographics, things you don't have control over. Um, your race, whether you're white or Asian, you have, you have a higher risk. Uh, for gender, postmenopausal women, women with hysterectomies, prolonged absence of menstruation, which is called amenorrhea, a, woman, a young woman that's not menstruating normally, um, or someone who's been recently pregnant or nursing. Um, Nursing is scary because the baby is being formed from the mother. So the baby's skeleton is coming from the nourishment from the mother. And if the mother's not in adequately intaking um, calcium, it's coming from her bones. And I've, I know there's a number of women who actually lose their teeth while they're nursing because their jaw is deteriorating from not getting enough uh, calcium to the baby. So nursing is a big deal uh, to be adequately uh, nourished. Unfortunately, as we talked about, over age 30, you begin to possibly lose. Some lifestyle things you do have control over. Smoking is also a risk, heavy exercise. Um, by that, I mean like endurance runners and things like that. Someone who's really, really a, a high power athlete, they're at risk for losing. Um, especially women oftentimes stop menstruating. Young women stop menstruating from over exercise. And that's, they're at especially high risk of this. Having a sedentary lifestyle, so exercise is important. Weight-bearing exercise is extremely important for us. Um, and then getting into some medical issues, uh, things that cause you to shed would be uh, chronic diarrhea, 
Deficiency of stomach acid relates to your inability to absorb minerals. You need to have the minerals there, the, the acid there, to help process the minerals into your body. Uh, Long-term use of acid-reducing drugs, anticonvulsants and steroids. The uh, anti, uh, use of anti-acid-reducing drugs, like say Prilosec for one example, they're actually causing your body not to make stomach acid. You now fall into the deficiency of stomach acid situation. These are so commonly used. And one study said that using that long term, you have like a 54% increase of getting a osteoporosis fracture. Overactive thyroid, uh, your thyroid when it's too active can cause your bones to break down. Or if you're on a thyroid drug and the doctor has overdosed you, essentially you're giving you, they've given you too much can cause bone loss. Um, certainly eating disorder, starvation, you're not getting adequate nutrition. Having a BMI body mass index less than 19, this would be considered to be underweight uh, people. So a thin frame is a risk for um, uh, low, low muscle mass, things like that is a risk for osteoporosis. To have a family history, uh, not much you can do about that. Um, conditions like celiac disease and weight loss surgery are involved in less absorption because of what's changed in your body. Okay, so in terms of dealing with drugs for osteoporosis, and what are the, for, what are the main ways doctors use right now? The family is called bisphosphonates, and the ones you see on the screen, the Fosamax, Actin, and Beniva are the ones most people would probably be on. Reclass is more of an IV, uh, so that would be at the doctor's office, but if you go into the pharmacy, you'd either be on one of the first three, um, and they're you know, very, very commonly used, both Fosamax and Actinel usually are once a week. Actinel can be once a week or once a month. And then Beniva is usually once a month. So how do these drugs work to supposedly increase your bone density? What they do is they reduce the rate at which the bone breakdown cells work. So again, we said before, you can either increase bone growth activity or you can decrease bone breakdown. And they, re they work by break by, by by slowing down the rate at which bones break down. Instructions are extremely important. This drug is extremely dangerous. You take it, you don't want to lie down or bend over for 30 to 60 minutes to prevent reflux. Take it with a tall glass of water and an empty stomach. Don't put anything else in your stomach for 30 to 60 minutes, after which you eat, uh, drink other liquids, and take medications. The situation is, if you don't swallow that properly, or if it comes back up and sits in your throat, it will eat a hole in your esophagus. So it's not a minor, it's not a minor thing. So common side effects of this whole class of drugs, inflamed and sore mouth, throat irritation, difficulty swallowing, heartburn, nausea, upset stomach, gastric ulcer, again it can do the same thing to your stomach, it can eat away at your stomach as well, gastritis, which is just inflamed stomach. And if you happen to be taking something like ibuprofen along with these drugs, there's a much, much higher risk of that happening. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage, abdominal pain, chest pain, kidney damage, eye pain, inflammatory eye disorders, muscle, bone, and joint pain, esophageal irritation, ulceration, and perforation. That's what I mentioned about the hole being burned in your throat. Now, another one is, is uh, these are the last two are really dangerous. The first one is called osteonecrosis, which means death of your jawbone. Because of the inhibition of the, or the way your normal bones work, replacing cell, you know, not breaking it down the way you should, replacing it the way you should, these, these drugs actually work on killing the, the bone breakdown cells. And they result in bone death. Another one is you hear you're trying to take this product to build, your, make your bones stronger. One of the side effects is a spontaneous fracture of your thigh bone, not related to falling. I had a customer walking down the street, her leg broke. Didn't even fall, didn't, didn't do anything, just walking down the street, and she broke her leg. That's the side effect of this drug. So. Some doctors will say, okay, you know, you've been on this, yeah.
You do want bone break, yes. The bone breakdown process is critical. You have to have bone breakdown. So this is inhibiting that. So essentially what's going on is that, let's just say I mentioned every 10 years you've replaced your skeleton normally. It may be 10, it may be 12, 13, 14 years before you replace your skeleton now because the bone breakdown cells are not working the way they should. So the quality of bone is not good, even though your bone density may look better. But, I mean, why would you break a leg if your bones were strong? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. So the scans look better, but are they really? I think it's a false sense of security. So a lot of doctors then will say, I don't want you on this drug longer than five years because it becomes extremely toxic to drugs if you stand at your bones, if you stand at longer than five years. Wait a minute, I'm trying to build my bones. Why can't I take this product? Well, it will cause the reverse. So they give them what's called a drug holiday. So the risk of atypical femoral fracture, which is the one, as I mentioned, the, the, the thigh bone breaking or the necrosis of the jaw, increases the longer you take these drugs. So your doctor may suggest temporarily stopping the drug, the practice known as a drug holiday. However, even if you stop, its negative effects can persist. After taking bisphosphonate for years, the medicine may still be in your bones. So it's, it's a matter of it will persist in there a long time. Because of this, most ex experts believe that it's reasonable for people who are doing well during treatment, those who have not broken any bones and are maintaining bone density, consider taking a holiday from their bisphosphonate after five years. Now, their holiday they're talking about is you may never go back on it again because they don't want to hurt you even though they're giving you this drug to do that. So it's really a very unusual way of, I think, practicing medicine. Another complication is, in getting regard to the jaw necrosis, is that if you need oral surgery, because of the osteonecrosis possibility, most oral surgeons will require you to stop taking the drug before you have your surgery and usually for a period of time before and after. And some recommend nine months before you have surgery to stop it and for three full months after. Because you, you, uh, your, your jaw won't heal as well because of the bone death going on. Here's a study, very interesting. Time to benefit of bisphosphonate therapy for the prevention of fractures in postmenopausal women with osteoporosis. So what they're doing is just looking at what value did women get, postmenopausal women get, by taking uh, these drugs? They had osteoporosis, and did they prevent fractures? The conclusion in the study was to prevent one hip fracture, 200 postmenopausal women with osteoporosis would need to receive bisphosphonate therapy for 20.3 months. So one woman out of 200. What about the other 199? Using the statistic I, I mentioned before that one in three women over 50 will experience a fracture, let's relate that to this study. So to prevent one fracture, the 200 women would have to take it for 20.3 months. The general fracture rate with women without any drugs is one in three. So if you have 200 women, you'd expect 66 of those women in the general population, not on drugs, would have a fracture. With this program, instead of 66, there would be 65. When you look at what they call the absolute risk benefit, meaning out of the total number and, and someone benefited, what was the benefit? So the risk of the fracture without uh, any drugs is 33%, one out of three. The risk taking the drug is 32.5%. So is that really justified with all the side effects that were given, the, the limited amount of time you can be on that? Uh, is this really a good idea? So let's talk then about doing some natural things with this. How do you support your body? First of all, I mentioned earlier weight-bearing exercise. Weight-bearing exercise is king when it comes to osteoporosis recovery. Things like walking, jogging, climbing stairs, uh, these help to build bones. Gravity works. When, when astronauts go into, the, into, the, into space, they come back with osteoporosis because they don't have gravity helping them build their bones, putting calcium into their bones. And if needed, get some professional advice. You know, maybe go to a, 
YMCA or someplace where they can give you a senior center where they may have osteoporosis exercises or you can learn maybe how to do it in your own home, but you learn what to do and how to do it so that you're being proactive. Certainly, if you're on certain drugs that are causing this, you want to talk to your doctor about that. We already talked about that, the anticonvulsants, the cortisone. Steroids like prednisone, they thin out your bones. That's, that's one of the things that they do. And then the, the, the drug, like the proton pump inhibitors. And then if you're on thyroid medication, make sure they're monitoring you carefully and dosing you properly. Uh, conditions like uh, inflammatory bowel disease and celiac, again, you want to work with your doctor on trying to keep those conditions under control so you can absorb the nutrients that you're taking in. So again, some more things you can do. Stop smoking, reduce caffeine, stop soft drinks, uh, decrease alcohol, moderate protein intake. The 100 grams a day would be like three palm sizes. So a palm size of protein is a good amount of protein to get at each meal. Moderate your salt use uh, and, and have a balanced, nutritious diet. Your bones are not just calcium. There, there are a lot of different things, so you need to have a whole variety of things. Yeah? As far as exercise, um, I heard that the, the astronauts, they were having to be rebounding. They said that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to do mitigation steps to try to prevent them from losing that. They didn't know what was going to happen until the first ones came home when they first sent them up. They whoa, what's going on here? So is rebounding really good? Rebounding is good. I don't know how well it works out in space, so I, that doesn't really apply to us. But rebounding is a good way to go because you're, you're going like this. Is that the, they said that's what happened with the astronauts when they came back to Earth. They had them do the rebounding. But that would be good, okay. yeah. So I wasn't wondering if you heard any more. No, it, it's like when you're walking, you're technically rebounding. You know, you're walking, you're, you're jarring your body as you walk. That's what you want. You want gravity working on you. Okay. So that, that, yes, rebounding would be a great way to go. Okay, so let's now talk about the individual nutrients that are really important in, in, uh, in bone structure. Calcium it makes your bones strong. It's stored in bones and teeth. Again, 99% of your calcium is in your bones. If it's not adequately consumed, your body will take it out of your bones, as I mentioned before. So over time, the bones will become fragile and weak, leading to these uh, conditions. So calcium is needed for proper function of your heart, muscles, blood clotting, and nerves. So calcium is not just bones. It's also involved in your muscles contract with calcium. They relax with magnesium. Um, they're just involved, again, blood clotting uh, and nerve function. They're involved in a lot of different functions in our body. So it's not just bones. That's why we use it up. We use it in other places. And we can make calcium. You know, some, some nutrients like vitamin D, you know, to a limited extent, we can make that. Calcium is a mineral. You cannot make minerals. Um, Every day, you, we lose calcium through our hair, you know, loss of hair, shedding skin, our nails, sweat, urine, feces. So we're losing, in fact, a lot of the risk factors for osteoporosis promote increased loss of calcium in your urine. Um, and so that's, again, another place your body is getting rid of calcium. That's why calcium needs to be replaced on a regular basis. In terms of diet, ways of getting calcium, dairy products, almonds, broccoli, kale, canned salmon with bones, so any of like, you know, it would be the same thing with uh, anchovies. A fish with the bones in it has calcium. Sardines, uh, soy products such as tofu, um, and if you have trouble getting enough calcium from your diet, then supplementation is really a, an important way to go. Uh, dietary calcium intake, uh, these are the, the uh, NIH guidelines for different ages, birth to six months, 400 milligrams, 12 Six months, six to 12 months, 600 milligrams. One to 10 years, 800 milligrams. 11 to 24 years, 1,200 milligrams. Women, 25 to 30, and men, 25 to 65, 1,000. Pregnant and nursing women, 1,200. Postmenopausal women, 1,500. Uh, and women and men over 65, 1,500. So there's various amounts based on your own individual body need, based on your age. And it's important to understand that you see doctors measure calcium in your blood work, that is not reflective of your bones. That's an electrolyte. Electrolytes keep you alive moment to moment. That's what your bones are sacrificing to keep your, your calcium levels normal range. So you cannot look at calcium in your blood level and say, hey, I'm good. I'm, I, don't, I don't need to be checked for osteoporosis. They're completely different things. That's your circulating calcium. Bones are your tissue calcium. Vitamin D. 
This is critical for building and maintaining healthy bones. Your body can only absorb calcium, the primary component of bone, when vitamin D is present. They began fortifying milk with vitamin D because kids were getting rickets, the, the vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D, here they're drinking all this milk and their bones are still thin. So you've got to have vitamin D in order to do that. Vitamin D has other functions. It's, one of the, I think, one of the most important vitamins that we can take in. It has anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidant effects. It's, it protects your nerves. It, it's hugely supportive of your immune system. It improves your muscle function and your brain cell activity. It just is a very, very big deal. In fact, there was a study about the elderly taking vitamin D unrelated to their bone density. They had less falls, so it helps with stability as well. Um, so some dietary sources of vitamin D, there aren't really very many, unfortunately. There is some in oily fishes like salmon, trout, whitefish tuna, mushrooms, eggs, fortified cereals, again, where they're adding it into milk or cereals. Um, and then uh, we make vitamin D in the sunlight. However, the amount you make depends on the day, the season, um, your own skin color, are you covering up? Are you putting on sunscreen? All those things really dramatically decrease your ability to make vitamin D. Um, and then uh, in New England, from October to April, we cannot make vitamin D. Even if you go skiing and get a sunburn, you didn't make any vitamin D. It has to do with the angle of the UV rays through the atmosphere. It keeps you from making vitamin D. So it's really critical um, in terms of dosing is, um, to make sure that you're adequately filled up with vitamin D. Studies show that 94% of Americans are not consuming the RDA of vitamin D, and it's a worldwide problem. Now, the RDA is only 600 units, and I recommend the average adult be on about 5,000 units. So there really is no way to get that from your, your, um, your food. Um, and it's best when you're, when you're on vitamin D. Again, I mentioned the 5,000. It's relative to you as an individual. The best way to do that is to get your vitamin After you go on a vitamin D supplement, Stay on it for three months, and then ask your doctor to check your blood level and see what your level is. The normal range on most labs is 30 to 100, and you don't want to be just within, just within the normal range. You don't want to be 32, 35, 40. You want to be, best would be around midpoint. If you take the lab, 30 to 100, and add it together, 130 divided by 2, you get 65. So the midpoint of this lab is 65. You don't want to be below midpoint. So I like to see people between 60 and 80, personally. If you're on the osteoporosis scale, I like you closer to 80. Magnesium, again, really very important. I mentioned before, it, it really involved in, in strength of bones. It's in, so it's important for building strong bones. It, it's important for muscle. People that get leg cramps, it's usually due to not enough magne uh, magnesium, because uh, magnesium causes muscles to relax. Um, like you take an Epsom salt bath before bed to calm down muscle cramps, that's magnesium. It goes through your, through in the water into your muscles and helps calm that down. Um, so it's also involved in healthy nerve function, regulating your blood sugar. It's very important in, in the functioning of insulin for diabetics and helping their control their blood sugar. With blood pressure, some people don't need blood pressure medicine if they're on adequate magnesium because me the blood pressure uh, can be due to constriction of blood vessels. It's squeezing your 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 blood, and it's the muscle around the vessel that's doing that, and it's like a cramp, and you relax the muscle, and you've got more room for, for your blood pressure. So sometimes it'll go down. Yes? Is there a different magnesium, like sometimes there's different um, versions of magnesium for the blood pressure? Which one, which magnesium is supposed to take? The, any um, mineral has to be bound to something for us to take it in. Okay. With magnesium, one of the more commonly used one is called magnesium oxide. It's because it's inexpensive, so it's used by a lot of companies to, to provide a less expensive product. But it's the least absorbed form of magnesium on the market. Um, oftentimes, it'll cause diarrhea because it stays in your gut, draws water into your gut, and, and you, then you have diarrhea from it. But you also have very, very poor absorption. So you're taking it in, but you're not getting it into your system. Some of the good ones are magnesium glycinate, magnesium citrate. We have a variety here um, that, that do that, that are very, we don't carry the bad forms of, of uh, the minerals. So there is a difference. There is a difference. And the other one is calcium. The most common calcium is called calcium carbonate. Again, it's inexpensive, uh, but calcium carbonate is Tums. 
So when you take your calcium carbonate supplement, you're neutralizing your stomach acid. And as I said before, you need stomach acid to absorb calcium. So they, they, they've done studies that postmenopausal women might absorb 10% of a calcium carbonate supplement. So there's other ones, calcium citrate, calcium malate. There's a variety of other good ones out there. OK, so magnesium, again, is also involved in helping make protein and DNA. It's really important for healthy energy in our body, especially releasing it from food. It's important for our heart function, respiratory function, and protective against diabetes. Again, with the heart and the respiratory, that's a lot of muscles involved in that. Your heart is a muscle. Your, your lungs have muscles. And the magnesium is critical for the way they function. It also is involved in helping make your vitamin D work better. It turns vitamin D into an active form. Um, deficiency increases the risk of osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, diabetes, inflammatory disorders, chronic fatigue, and even depression. And actually, in specific, more specifically with women with PMS, there's a very good mental effect with magnesium and may help relieve depression caused by, by PMS. Um, and the problem is with our food. Our food is at risk. We're not getting the magnesium we should be getting from our food. It's estimated that about 80% of Americans are deficient in adequate magnesium. Um, you have improper farming where they're not, re they're not putting back into the soil the minerals that need to be there to, for the plant to draw up, and magnesium is one of those. And then when they, when they process food, they strip it, and magnesium often goes by the way. So a lot of our foods, they should have magnesium in them, either from farming or from just eating it, but they're not there. So some of the foods that do have magnesium, avocados, legumes, dark chocolate, nuts, seeds, whole grains, bananas, leafy greens. And then again, they fortify things like breakfast cereals and, and other fortified foods. And then dosing guidelines, it's, again, it's estimated that 61% are not consuming the, the RDA, um, and 80% and or so are not getting adequate levels for their body. The RDA, by the way, is the, the amount of something they've determined when they make these numbers up, the health authorities, that this is what your body needs to be at its lowest function, meaning almost like you won't be dead if you take this. Uh, so the level is like the 100% daily value is, is completely worthless. If you have a vitamin that says 100%, don't even take it. You're already getting that from your food. Yes, you need more than that. And that's where going higher would come into play. Um, so the RDAs are you need to be optimal, not just at the low level of normal. So the RDA for magnesium is around 420 um, and milligrams. And I recommend more in the range of 500 to 750 per day. If you're in the osteoporosis category, I opt more to the 750 side. Yeah. Do you take too much magnesium? Generally, no. Usually, it will be self-limiting. It would be diarrhea, if you, even if you're taking a good form and you took too much, it would probably end up in diarrhea. Your body just will not absorb a lot. But certainly, obviously, you want to do things within proper guidance. You know, you don't just take a ton of it. You want to make sure you're getting advice on how to do that. And they also, in regarding blood work, again, will show magnesium. That is not reflective, just like the calcium is not reflective. Magnesium is another electrolyte. <clears throat> your body has to keep it at normal levels to keep you alive moment to moment. So in this case, it will draw it out of your bones, but more it will draw it out of your muscles because that's one of the main magnesium storage sites uh, is in your muscles. So again, blood work is not reflective of either calcium or magnesium. Vitamin K, another critical vitamin. This one is really, really important for blood coagulation, healthy bone metabolism, meaning bone function, and it also inhibits the way that calcium deposits on your arteries. So it prevents hardening of the arteries. So when you take a calcium supplement, this helps to keep you going into your bones and not into your blood, into your, the lining of your arteries. Studies in clinical trials consistently indicate that vitamin K has a positive effect on bone mineral density and decreases bone, uh, decreases the fracture risk. And actually in Japan, K is approved for treatment for osteoporosis. Vitamin K comes in two forms. One is called vitamin K1, the other is vitamin K2. It really doesn't matter. They're both protective. K2 seems to be a little bit more protective to bones uh, but, uh, than K1, but they both, they're both beneficial. And uh, here where you can get some of these, in terms of, of uh, vitamin K2, uh, we make vitamin K2 in our, actually our good bacteria inside our gut makes vitamin K2. And they make about a third of our daily need. 
um, in our, inside our own bodies. Some food sources uh, for K1 would be green leafy vegetables, broccoli, prunes, green peas and green beans, avocados, Brussels sprouts, and then for vitamin K2, hard cheeses and natto, um, which is a fermented soy product. Guidelines for vitamin K, the daily value level is 100 micrograms. Um, again, I like being optimal, and I would recommend somewhere in the range of 180 micrograms. You can go higher than that, but that would be a good level to be on. Some more tips about this. One, you want to try to optimize your digestion. Again, you want to be sure to bring in the things that you're eating properly. So you need digestive juices to do that. So by drinking a glass of water about half hour prior to your meal, you have now the juices on hand to make your digestive juices. In fact, dehydration is one of the frustrating things for your stomach because it can't make the digestive juices if you're not adequately hydrated. So drink, being hydrated all the time is good, but in particular, drinking a glass or two of water before each meal. And then when you eat your meal, limit it to about a half a glass of any beverage because you're diluting your stomach acid. Your stomach acid is very strong and it needs to be that way to process your food again, especially for absorbing minerals. So you wanna, don't want to put a lot in there uh, while you're eating. Um, the, so again, the stomach acid is needed to absorb the minerals. And then the other thing to think about is what's called the acid-base balance of foods. There are what are known as alkaline-forming foods and acid-forming foods. What that means is that once they get into your body, they have an effect on your pH. Your, your, and I'll go for that in just a second. Um, and that affects the way you're able to retain uh, minerals in your body. So here you have a chart. The pH neutral on the pH scale, this is 7. Very acidic. Weight on this end is, is 1 to 0 or 1. And way over here is 14. So if you are, and this is not the, it's important to understand, it's not the food itself that causes the, the uh, being alkaline forming or acid forming. It's what it does once it's inside your body. When you have an alkaline forming food in your body, your pH of your urine stays up and your body feels comfortable. If your urine is acidic, it'll take calcium out of your bones and buffer, try to raise the pH of your urine using your own internal minerals. So that's how you lose things. So, for instance, just as, a, just as a broad example, alkaline forming foods tend to be the fruits and vegetables. Acidic forming tend to be grains and proteins like, like eggs and meats. That's general, general terms. Doesn't mean you can't have them. It just means you want to be in good balance and focus more on eating. The more you can eat this way, the more benefit it is. So for instance, if you're drink, eating something over here, and you switch to here, you've made an important step in the right direction. Or even if you're eating here and you go to here, you're doing the same thing. You're going, you're get going in the right direction. One way of, actually let me, okay, um, let me explain that and I'll tell you how you can test for that. This study talked about dietary acid and alkali influencing calcium in your bones. So they look at, they looked at the composition of what people were eating and they found that acidifying constituents, which are the ones that cause their acid forming, such as animal proteins, may negatively affect calcium metabolism and accelerate bone resorption, bone loss, thus representing an aggravating factor for osteoporosis. In other words, it's causing more osteoporosis happening. The acid forming diet incre increased urinary calcium excretion by 74% compared with the base forming diet. So again, you've got an acidic urine and the body says, I don't like that. So it's dumping. It's trying to bring it up to the, the neutral pH uh, before it goes out, before it leaves your body. This observation confirms that renally excreted, which means it's leaving through your kidneys, uh, these acids derived from food influence calcium metabolism and that alkalizing nutrients inhibit bone resorption. So this would be considered to be a, a bone building diet and this is a bone loss diet. Again, any, any way you go this way, even from here over, you're going that way, you're promoting bone loss. Any way this way, you're promoting you know, bone gain. In terms of testing, I have a question. yeah. 
I'll get to that at the end. Yeah. If you kind of lose weight and you're kind of going on a Atkins type diet, high protein, um, low low carb, does that influence that acid? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because the more protein you eat, the more acid acid forming food you're eating. And so would that weaken your bones? Yes, your, it your could it could potentially do. That's one of the reasons. You lose weight, but you lose <laughs> you're right. Right. Yes. That's one of the reasons that the risk factors for osteoporosis is a high protein diet. That's another that's another part of that. Yeah. Okay. The rest of you take a very high pH water. Some water has a really high pH. Uh -huh. When you drink that water and still eat the meat, will that balance it somehow? No. Um, it's the confusion between is the is the food acidic or basic coming into your body and what happens to it once it's in there. For instance, if you look at on this list that I have, lemons are in the alkaline forming. Lemons are acidic, mm -hmm. but when they get in your body, they cause an alkaline forming effect. So just because you're drinking a high pH water does not mean it's going to make a high pH urine. Okay. Right. So the, a, lot, a lot of these, there's a lot of multi-level marketing with pH water and things like that. Um, if you're drinking a water that's a lot out of normal, you can get a lot of dental erosion. Um, some people, for instance, they, they like apple cider vinegar. And one guy just was drinking it. Well, that's acid. I mean, that's, that hurts your teeth. Same thing would be true with, with alkaline. It's like taking a light lye or you know, oven cleaner and, and putting it in your mouth and drinking it. So I'd be careful of that. So no, the, the pH of the item does not relate to what it does inside your body. It's really important to understand that. So if you look at that list, you'll see, OK, these things are acidic, and yet, hey, they're helping me a lot with my alkaline forming. OK, anybody else? OK, I'll get to a minute on how to test that. We'll get to that. That'll be at the end. OK, so in terms of supplemental support for, um, for osteo, uh, Porosis osteopenia. Um, if you have thin bones, um, the, the, the way of restoring them to normal health is, first of all, a good calcium magnesium supplement. I like a product called Signacal. By the way, all the products I recommend are up right up here. Um, you would take two tablets three times a day, either at mealtime or bedtime. This provides the 1,500 milligrams of calcium I mentioned and the 750 milligrams of magnesium that I mentioned. Um, there's also some, some other nutrients in here. This product was kind of specifically designed for, for bone thinning um, support. Uh, a good level of vitamin D I mentioned already. I prefer starting with 5,000, but then verifying that over time. Uh, personally, I take 8,000 due to I've done test, my blood testing, and I, for some reason, I need a little bit more. I'm on, I'm on 8,000 a day. The vitamin K2, again, to direct the calcium to go to your bones and not your arteries, is 180 microgram a capsule a day with food. Um, strontium is the workhorse of this whole protocol. Um, this is another mineral, and this encourages the bone building cells to grow faster. So this is, this is the opposite of what the Fosamax is doing, um, it, that where it's decreasing the bone breakdown cells. This is increasing the bone building cells. So a capsule two times a day with meals, and um, there is some interaction with strontium and calcium. But if you, if you restrict how much you're taking, there's no problem. For instance, with calcium products, you should never take more than 500 milligrams at one time because you will overwhelm the pathways through which you're absorbing it. So even if it's a well-absorbed form, if it's more than 500 milligrams, you're, not, you're at risk of not getting that into your system. That's why this is, for the Signacal, it's two tablets three different times a day. For the Strontium, it's a capsule two times a day. And as long as you keep it so you take two Signacal and one Strontium, that's perfectly fine. If you took two Signacal and two Strontium, you'd be overwhelming your pathways. So it's, it's going by the directions here is what that will do for you. And again, after three months, get your vitamin D level checked to make sure you are um, within you know, the, the acceptable range. So if you have normal bones uh, and you're trying to prevent osteoporosis, so this would be for postmenopausal women and men 65 plus. 
there's a reduction. Instead of taking the Signacal two tablets three times a day, you take two, two times a day. The logic behind that is your daily need is 1,500. And again, with the phone thinning, the, you want to take in more than you actually need so you can store some away. So the average American diet is considered to be about 500 milligrams of calcium per day. So if you're on the 1,500 milligrams with the bone thinning program, you're getting a total of 2,000, 1,500 to run your body and 500 to store into your bones over time. With normal bones, you'd only need two twice a day, which is 1,000 milligrams, and then you're getting your other 500 from your diet and you're, you're fully, um, fully adi you know, adequate there. Same level of vitamin D, uh, capsule a day with a meal, and that's it for that for normal bones. So if somebody is on the bone thinning program, this would be what they'd stay on until their bones are normal and they would drop back to the normal bone program. And then this is for normal bones for women 25 to 50 and men 25 to 65. Um, two tablets a day of the Signacal would be adequate and one a day of the vitamin D3. This, I already talked about this already, that there's different forms of minerals that are better absorbed than others. This talks about calcium carbonate. Um, and it can really cause a lot of problems, even things like constipation, gas, and bloating, because it's neutralizing your stomach acid. You're not digesting well. You're not absorbing your foods. So it's actually the same complication that's created by Prilosec. You're, you're not getting adequate acid effect in your body. So in essence, this calcium supplement is almost inducing osteoporosis. Um, so if you did that, you would be the K2? If you did that? Cor correct. The, with, you don't need for, for normal bones? Yeah, for normal bones, usually it would be if you're in the higher level of calcium, like you're going above what would normally be, like the, you're, with the thin bones, you're, going, you're, you're trying to get 2,000 milligrams a day. So I recommend the K2 um, for, that, for that time. But for regular bones, if you're taking a good multivitamin, there's some K2 in there or K1 in there. You're also making some in your blood, in your gut. And then certainly there's dietary sources. And the, and the diet is all the things we should be eating anyway, the green leafy vegetables and all those things like that. So um, generally the cave is not that necessary with normal bones. Okay, so in terms of testing, how do you keep up with what's going on? Certainly the hallmark is the DEXA scan. It's usually recommended to have one done every two years. Um, and that's the, you know, really the only way of really knowing where you are. When they do your scan, they'll give you what's called a T-score. Um, this is a way of uh, evaluating how you compare. So this system measures your bone loss against that of a healthy young adult, uh, according to standards established by the World Health Organization. And it's called your T-score, and it's a standard deviation between your measured bone loss and average. So this would be a, um, a scan. The green means it's, a, it's minus one or above is considered normal bone density, a score, a T-score of minus 1.1 to minus 2.4 is considered osteopenia, and a score of minus 2.4 and lower is considered to be osteoporosis, again, with higher risk of fracture. And here on this, you see the T-score, and this person has 0.8, 1.1, 1.3, and 1.0. So this is, this is normal, normal, right on the edge, and this is just entering osteopenia for this person. And then getting back to testing at home, um, pH testing strips are available to test your urine. Uh, what you would do is you do a first urine of the day. You either pee in a cup or just hold the strip in your urine stream. And then you compare it to a little chart and you see how you fall. And you want to be right in around seven range. Uh, and you can use that to then affect your diet. Gee, if I'm not where I should be. Let me look at what I'm eating and see if I can change that. Because essentially, when you see an acidic urine, you're dumping calcium. So you're in a calcium, if you're, you're in, a, in a calcium loss mode. And that's it for today. Uh, next time, oh, actually, one, one last thing. This is a, a, a lady sent me an email, testimonial. Um, and she said, uh, Hi, Marty. I finally had my second bone scan in May and wanted to let you know my progress. It's been three years since I've been following your recommendations for taking the supplements. The lumbar spine T-score changed from minus 2.4 to minus 1.4. So they went, she went from on the verge of osteoporosis 
to you know, just entering osteopenia. The hip total score changed from minus 1.4 to minus 0.8. So minus 1.4 is osteopenia and minus 0.8 is normal. And the femoral neck, uh, which is your top of your, your leg bone, went from minus 2.3 to minus 1.8. Says I was so excited to see the positive results. They probably would have been better if I had exercised more. I'm starting a more aggressive exercise program and hoping in two to three years being back to normal on all my scores. Thank you so much. So that's uh, yeah, and that and that's I see that anybody who I ask people that I work with, please bring me your numbers. I usually see them when they come in and talk to me, and I say come back and give me your numbers. And I've yet to see anybody that hasn't had results similar to this. So this is the way of restoring normal, healthy. Um, she had done that for three years. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a slow process. You're, you're just slowly, it's like growing a plant. You're slowly rebuilding. And most doctors actually are happy, like with the Fosamax and those drugs where they give you a drug holiday. As long as you stay where you are, they're happy. They don't, they, certainly they'd love to see you get stronger, but they know that's not going to happen with their therapy. So just, just stopping the loss is a big deal. Because usually it's every time they come in, you lower and lower and lower. Well, I guess the reason, we, you know, what was the reason for the hip replacement? Was it um, they had a fracture, there had thin bones, or was it, was it, yeah, well, that would be more arthritis. arthritis. Yeah, and that's an upcoming talk, but, uh, but n not yet, but it, but, it, but, it, but it will be. But, yeah, same thing with, you know, knees. Those are usually um, arthri arthritic. It's a degradation of the, right, there's a cartilage layer. Bones are separated by a cartilage layer. And they, it needs to be robust, needs to be strong. In fact, same thing like with bone cells. Cartilage is constantly growing and being worn away. And as long as you keep, keep growing it as fast as you wear it away, then you have good, strong, healthy joints. As you wear it away faster than you replace it, that gets thinner and thinner, and, th and eventually the bones begin to bump. That's when you get pain and inflammation and lack of range of motion. And then that can cause wear on the, now the bones are rubbing and they can wear, they can round out, they can rub on each other. So that's the problem with, with arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis, right. And that might be why someone would have knee replacement. Sure, yeah. And, and that can also be based on your own activity. Runners are really at risk for that. Uh, people that are on their feet all like mailmen that walk roots, they're more at risk for that. Weightlifters, because they're really putting a lot of compression on their joints, are more at risk for that. So it's wear and tear. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that would be a good idea. Check with the VNA. Um, uh, if there's any senior centers around, they may know where you can go or they may even sponsor something. Um, so again, it's just one of those things of finding, finding out what you can do on your own or who you can do it with. And so you have you know, a pal to keep each other accountable and, and do that kind of thing and be, be more fun. But yeah, it's, it's really, really important. Anybody else? Okay, well, if you want to sign up for the CBD while you're here, um, again, it's to be the, the second Saturday of uh, next month. You can, the little sign up board is right there. If you want to talk about any supplements, I can do that. Again, we have all the products right there. Um, and there's actually a little brochure as well that kind of summarizes my talk today that gives the directions and things like that. So if you're interested in that. Well, thank you so much for coming.